we go. All right. Yep. We're live. Good to have everyone that's here with us today. We got a really great crowd here. Several visitors and regulars, and, and that's uh, that's very encouraging to me and everybody else. You know? <coughs> and uh, so uh, we appreciate y'all being here today. Uh, and appreciate those of you who tune in on Facebook and uh, later on on YouTube when Chris gets that done for us. And, and so we're really grateful for that. All right, very good. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to study, uh, we're, we're going to begin a study on righteousness. And so if you want to find your way to the book of Romans, that's where we're going to begin. And so I, as I, you know, I'm always <coughs> pondering and considering uh, messages that will be beneficial, that will be helpful, uh, and give information uh, from the scriptures that maybe we haven't considered in the right way or, or pondered. And so I thought that uh, righteousness would be a good topic, a good subject for us to study for a little while. And of course, as always, when I begin to study and think about it, my intent is to prepare a message and come in here, one message, preach that message, and then move on to something else next week. And uh, everybody's laughing because they know. And, uh, and so as I was studying today, uh, and I'm going to give some numbers in a minute, and you'll kind of understand why I'm saying what I'm saying now, but as I began to study and had been pondering this, you know, over the last couple of weeks and started, you know, researching and looking up the verses and putting my mind on the verses, meditating on the verses, uh, and then as I sat down to put notes together this morning, I said, hey, you know what, I'm ever going to be able to do, even scratch the surface or do this just if, if I try to cram all this in and one Sunday. And so I'm going to just tell you up front, this is righteousness part one. And, uh, and so uh, you'll have to come back next week and probably the week after that. Maybe even the week after that uh, in order to get the, uh, the full thing. And even then, our feeble attempts won't near uncover everything there is to, to uncover. I often say about the scripture, it's, it's like a deep, clear well uh, every time you put your bucket in it, you come up with fresh water. And uh, that's a good understanding of, of the Word of God. It doesn't matter how long you've been studying, uh, how long you've been uh, knowing the Lord, how long you've been in the book. Uh, every time I go, uh, I come up with fresh water. And so that's, uh, that's, that's part of the blessedness of the book. All right, so with that being said, uh, when I was a student, and I think you'll relate to this to some degree, uh, but when I was a student in Bible college, and keep in mind, I was just a kid. Uh, I started Bible college in Chattanooga at Tennessee Temple when I was 16 years old. And they bent a couple of, a couple of rules and let me start school. And I was supposed to at least be 17, but Dr. Robertson bent the rules. He could do that. And, uh, and he let me start school at 16. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I was just a kid, uh, and I didn't know a whole lot, but I knew I was saved by the grace of God, and, uh, and I knew I wanted to serve the Lord. <coughs> but my understanding of things, my perception of things when it came to righteousness, uh, especially as it came to righteousness that I might have, okay, now, there was a whole lot I didn't know. I was very ignorant about many things in Scripture. And so, because of my perception, I don't know that I was taught this necessarily, but because of my perception, by what I had heard preached in those independent fundamental Baptist churches that were associated with all that, uh, my perception was, for me and my righteousness and my being right with God, well, you know, there'd be times and days where I didn't feel, you know, paying attention to the words I'm using, there were times and days when I didn't feel like I was right with God. You ever been there? I didn't feel like I was right with God. Well, again, that was my ignorance of the scriptures, and hopefully we'll be able to uncover that as we go through this study. But that was how I felt. That was my perception that, that on certain days I didn't feel like I was right with God. Therefore, I felt like I needed to do more stuff to be more right with God. 
I needed to quit doing things or I needed to start doing things so I could be closer to the Lord, so I could feel closer to the Lord, so I could be more right with God. And so uh, we're talking 1973, 74 school year, and, uh, you know, early 70s. And uh, so if I didn't feel like I was right with God, I didn't feel close to God, I felt like I needed to do something else to be more right with God, uh, I'd go to the barber more frequently and get a little closer haircut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, back then was the long hair days, and of course, I, I, they cut all that off at the boys' home, and the school wouldn't allow it to be but so long. But and most of the time, I would wear it as long as they would allow me to wear it. And uh, but if I didn't feel right with God, I'd go sit down and I say, "Cut it off," you know, <laughs> do that high and tight, you know. And uh, and I'd come out there. Oh, I'm more spiritual now. I'm going to close their haircut. <laughs> that was how I felt. It wasn't a pride thing necessarily, but it was a perception of what it meant or what I needed to do to be close to the Lord and have and be more right with God. Uh, I would read uh, more chapters of the Bible every day. You know, get up earlier or stay up later or whatever and read more chapters. Because, okay, I'm reading three chapters today, but I don't feel right. And so maybe if I'll read six chapters a day or ten chapters a day, maybe that will help me to be more right with God. Again, there's certainly nothing wrong with getting as much of the Word of God in you every day as you can, but I was doing it because I thought that would help me to be more right with God. Uh, passing out gospel tracts was a big thing. And so I would pass out, you know, a hundred more gospel tracts this week. So y'all kind of know where I'm going. In other words, I felt like that I needed to do things to be more right with God. And that was just a real dread me. And so after, uh, you know, I would do those things and feel more right with God and, and have that perception that, okay, I'm doing these things. Well, you know, after a while, everything's good, everything's cool, and so you slap back off again. <laughs> And then you go however many months or how much time, and you know, I I need to go get another haircut again. I need to start passing out more tracks again. I need to start reading my Bible more. I need to pray more. I need to spend more time on my knees and you know, all that stuff. And uh, it took me a long time to come to an understanding that uh, we're not to do and, and get this quote, so to speak. We are not to do things in order to be right with God. We don't do what we do in order to be right with God. We do what we do because we are right with God. And so as we go through the study and the scriptures, maybe you'll understand from a scriptural foundation, how is it that we say that? We don't do what we do in order to become. We do what we do because we already are. And that's a big difference. That's law and grace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord for grace. Mm -hmm. Now, as I look at my Bible, of course, you know I do this, and, and I think it puts a little perspective to all of this when I pick out the words. So, you know, first thing I do, I want to study righteousness. So I type in my Bible app on my device and, and the word righteousness in my King James Bible. And 291 verses from Genesis to Revelation have the, have the word righteousness in them. Uh, 200 times in the Old Testament, 91 times in the New Testament. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, 70, 70 of those two, the, in other words, the majority, the, uh, there's more times the word righteousness is used in the book of Psalms than there is in any other Old Testament book. And, and it's used 70 times, 70 verses in Psalms, the word righteousness is used. That's 35% that's of the 200 times the word righteousness is used in the Old Testament. I always think those things are interesting. So a third of the time, a little over a third of the time, the psalmist, David, primarily uh, referred to righteousness. And then in our New Testament, I said there was 90, 91 
mentions or verses with rebel with the righteousness there uh, fifty seven times in Paul's epistles Romans through Philemon Paul uses the word righteousness uh, that's sixty three percent of the use of the word righteousness in our New Testament was used by Paul our apostle that's pretty significant isn't it and so then as I look at that uh, then 33 times in the book of Romans. And so out of those 57 times, the vast majority of those terms, the use of the word righteousness, is found in the, again, the book of Romans. And that's where we're going to start there today. Uh, that's 36% of the overall use, and, and that's 58% of Paul's usage of the thing. And so again, that's pretty significant. Now, as soon as I say 33 verses in Romans and a total of 57 verses in, Rome, in Paul's writings, you're thinking to yourself, if Brother Sam is going to teach every one of those verses, this ain't going to be a few weeks, this is going to be a few months. And so I'm not going to hit every one of those verses, but we're going to pull some together and hit some highlights. But we're going to start in the book of Romans. Oftentimes, when I talk to you about approaching your Bible and reading, study your Bible, what two books do I tell you to focus on and to read? Romans and Ephesians. Romans and Ephesians. Good. How many of you knew that? Speak your hand up. I didn't hear it. I woke up. All right. So, all right. You've been listening. Romans and Ephesians. And so you, you want to spend time reading and get started reading, then I encourage folks Romans and Ephesians. You'll spend a lot of time in Romans and Ephesians, and then from there, read everything else, especially Paul's epistles, and then from there, everything else. But Romans and Ephesians will really get you grounded in the Word of God. Authors say that Romans is foundational truth for the church, the body of Christ. Ephesians is more advanced revelation, more advanced truth for the church, the body of Christ. Romans was written during Paul's journeys through the book of Acts. Ephesians was written shortly before Paul lost his life. I believe Ephesians was written and then 2 Timothy was written uh, from that Roman prison <coughs> right before Paul was beheaded. And so, you know, Paul got revelation, so he teaches us foundational stuff in the book of Romans and then more advanced, more detailed, uh, further revelation built upon Romans by the time we get to Ephesians. Okay? So, I know that's foreign to some of you, but approach your Bible that way and, and study that way and it'll be helpful to you. And so, if we're going to study righteousness as presented to us by our Apostle Paul, then Romans is the appropriate place, especially where, by, where he mentions righteousness more there than any other place. And so, we're in Romans chapter 1. We're going to spend some time in Romans 1 through 6. We'll see how far we get. Even part one in my notes may turn into part two. So we'll, we'll just see where it goes. I'm not going to be in a big rush. Uh, uh, I'll just stop when it's time to stop. All right. And I know you're chuckling at that too. <laughs> and so uh, there you go. All right. So we're in Romans chapter one. And so I'm making my notes and I've written here Romans chapter one, uh, the righteousness of God. And the righteousness of God, as we're going to read this, is revealed in the gospel of Christ. And so begin with me at Romans chapter 1, begin reading at verse uh, 13. We're going to read 13 through, uh, uh, through 19 here. Romans 1, 13 through 19. Paul picks up here, he says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Uh, that's a good thing to do a little Google search, little Google, do a little word search in your Bible. Where Paul uses the word ignorant. I wouldn't have you to be ignorant. Things he doesn't want you to be ignorant of. And uh, so it just caught my attention there. Paul says, Now I will not have you ignorant, brethren. Uh, and we know that ignorant is not stupid. Ignorant is just we don't know. Right? I'm just ignorant. Uh, Daddy came home one day and the little boy said, Daddy, what's the difference between ignorance and apathy? And Daddy said, Son, I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> he answered the question, didn't he? And so ignorance and apathy. So I will not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, and that 
word in our King James Bible, let, has the idea of hindered, okay, restricted. And so, but I was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. We know that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, so we know he's writing this letter to the Romans. And who's he writing it to? The Gentiles in Rome. So it goes on and says, verse 14, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. And as I read through that a little bit, then I think about what I know about who Paul was and what his ministry was. So he's right to these folks at Rome, the capital of the Gentile world, and he says in verse 14, I'm debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians. And so when you read about the Greeks in Paul's letters and uh, make reference to the Greeks, those were the what I call porch dog Gentiles. Those were the Gentiles that identified with Israel, came to the synagogues, worshipped with the Jews in the synagogues, uh, not necessarily proselytes, so to speak, but <clears throat> maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But they were, they were, Greeks were Gentiles who identified with the God of Israel. They sought after the wisdom of the God of Israel. And so they were blessed under the Abrahamic covenant of Genesis 12 in doing that. Okay? And so he says, I'm debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. That's those wild dog Gentiles. Okay? And y'all know the difference. How many of you have a porch dog at home? You know, a yard dog, cat dog, rat dog, whatever you want. That. You got dogs. Well, you know the difference between the porch dog, the lap dog, the yard dog, and the coyote or the wolf out there in the wild. So Paul's addressing both kinds of Gentiles right here. And then to reinforce that, he says both to the wise, the Greeks, who were seeking wisdom from the God of Israel, and to the barbarians, the unwise. Okay? The unwise. And so, uh, because they rejected Israel, they rejected the God of Israel, you know, they were worshiping all kind of idols and all kind of stuff. And so there you got the idea. So Paul's painting a broad picture of the direction he's going as he writes this letter. Verse 15, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at home also. He hadn't been there yet. Paul didn't get to Rome until he got there handcuffed in shackles as a Roman prisoner, right? But he was really wanting to go. He writes to go to Romans right there at the early part of Acts chapter 20. Uh, he's received the gospel of the grace of God. He knows he wants to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He knows he wants to reach not only the porch dog Gentiles, but the wild dog Gentiles. And so he's writing this letter kind of in preparation. I really want to get there. So he says, uh, so as much as in me is, verse 15, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you uh, that are at Rome also. Verse 16, we quote this all the time, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And I also like to point out that if you've got something else besides the King James Bible, it just says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What we've got to know is more than one gospel in the Bible, and the gospel that Paul's not ashamed of is, is the gospel of Christ. And so he tells us that. So he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, well, what is the it? The gospel of Christ. So it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that straightens up, flies right, walks the aisle, confesses their sins, gets baptized, starts giving money, puts on a coat and tie. Is that what it says? No. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and salvation to everyone that will simply believe. believe. To the Jew first and also to the Greek at this time. He says verse 17 now. Here's, we're trying to get to the word, right? For therein, well, therein is what? The gospel of Christ. 
which is the power of God and salvation. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. I want to go ahead and add verse 18 and 19. He says, because 17 says, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And I'm going to go back and talk about that a minute. But he also says, now verse 18 and 19, for the wrath of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. But he goes on and says, but the wrath of God, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Then he goes on and talks about that a little while. But I just want to point out verse 17, 18. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. So, there's something to ponder there. Well, let's talk about that verse 17 just a minute. The wrath for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So Paul says that he walks into this thing. He says, I want to come. I don't want you to be ignorant. I want to come. I want to share the gospel with you. I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. I'm a debtor to the wise and to the unwise. And I, I really want to get to Rome and impart unto you to share with you this gospel of Christ, which is the power of God and <laughs> salvation, because in that gospel of Christ is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Well, what's the idea there? Paul knew that he understood the faith of Christ. And we'll talk about that as we study. And Paul knew that he had trusted the faith of Christ for his own personal salvation. And Paul knew that if he could share the faith of Christ with other folks, and they would believe that, exercise their faith, they also could be saved by the grace of God. And so he says there, verse 17 again, For therein, in the gospel of Christ, in which Paul was not ashamed, the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God and the salvation, he says, For in that, for therein, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So as we consider and begin considering this thing about righteousness and the righteousness of God, when it starts out, the righteousness of God was revealed when one who knows and has trusted and believed the gospel of Christ and they're relying solely and completely upon the work of Christ for their salvation and in knowing that they're able to turn around and talk to someone else and share their faith and share that gospel <coughs> and share that truth well therein is the righteousness of God revealed go with me Real quickly, this is for the just in case and what ifs, right? We're talking about the gospel of Christ. Don't lose your place in Romans, but go to 1 Corinthians 15. The Romans, and the next book is 1 Corinthians. There are 16 chapters, so you want to go to the back because we're in chapter 15. But what is this gospel of Christ that Paul preached? So we're 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. And I guess maybe I should kind of put this together as well, too. As Paul wrote his letters, he wrote 1 Corinthians. He wrote other books first, but then he wrote 1 Corinthians. Then he wrote Romans. Then he wrote 2 Corinthians. So when he's writing Romans and referring to the gospel of Christ, he had already written 1 Corinthians and laid out what the gospel of Christ is. Okay? All right. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren. Is he talking to saved folks? Moreover, brethren. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. For what did Paul say he wanted to come to Rome to preach? The gospel of Christ. So what's the gospel that Paul preached to these Corinthians? The gospel of Christ, which is the power of God and salvation, wherein the righteousness of God is revealed 
from faith to faith. Everybody with me? We're good to go. All right. So it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Paul says, this is the God. You know what gospel I preached to you? He said, you received that gospel. You heard it. You received it. You believed it. And so he says, uh, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand. You stand in that gospel. Hmm. Verse 2. By which also ye are saved. Not hoping to be saved, but saved. Well, how are we saved? We're saved by the gospel. How do we hear the gospel? Someone who knew the gospel, who had trusted Christ, heard the gospel of Christ, trusted the gospel of Christ for their salvation. They told us about the gospel of Christ. From their faith, they revealed it to our faith so that we could see the righteousness of God. He says, so, and it's by that which we're saved. We're not saved by, again, we're not saved by straightening up, flying right, doing right, quitting doing the don't, you know, stop doing the don'ts and start doing the do's. None of that brings about salvation. As a matter of fact, all of that perverts and takes away from the opportunity to be saved. You've heard me say many, many times, there's going to be a lot of people go to hell from a church pew and go to heaven from a bar stool. And why do I say that? Because so many folks sitting in a church pew are trusting that they're going to go to heaven because they're sitting in a church pew. I go to church. I know the songs. I pay a tithe. I dress right. I go to the right places. And I don't go to the wrong places. I teach a Sunday school class. I sing in the choir. Etc, etc, etc. That's what they're trusting to go to heaven. Oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm doing all this stuff. And then, if you ain't doing all that stuff, they're looking at you saying, well, I don't know if you're going to heaven or not. Because you ain't doing the stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about the righteousness of God here. And so he goes on then. So, and, and then that guy sitting on the pew, sitting on the bar stool, you go talk to him. He knows he's a sinner. He knows he has no and obviously I'm not talking about everybody in the church pew, and I'm certainly not talking about everybody on the bar stool. I'm just, you know, giving you the idea here, the potential. You got that guy sitting on a bar stool, smoking a cigarette, skull can in his back pocket. Maybe got a little, maybe got a little, maybe got a little spicy language here and there. Do we? <laughs> Leo. Yeah, does this mean I gotta start drinking again? <laughs> That's one of those I point the finger at you and pull more point it back at me, right? And so. And so, you know, his language might be a little spicy, and, and he's drinking a cold beer or two or three or whatever it is he's drinking. And, and uh, But, you know, you go to talking to that guy, and where are you going to go when you, where are you going to go when you die? Hey, I'm going straight to heaven. What makes you say that? I mean, look at you. I see the skull can ring. I see the cigarette in your hand. I, I, I've been hearing your language. I see how much you're drinking. And uh, what makes you say that? Look, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I have no hope of a home in heaven apart from what Jesus did for me. Mm -hmm. When he went to that cross and died for my sins, was buried and was raised again. I had no hope of heaven, but he provided the way that I'm trusting him. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so he says in verse 2, as we're in Romans chapter, or 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2, by which also ye are saved. That gospel of Christ, that gospel that Paul preached, that gospel that they have received and wherein they stand, 
And he goes on verse 2, by which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. Again, don't let that confuse you. That's not an if conditional thing. That's just a reminder. If y'all will remember what I preached to you, that's all that is. Don't, don't make that a conditional thing. Because it's not. It's just a reminder. If you keep in memory what I preached to you. And then he goes on and says, unless you have believed in vain. And that throws people off as well. well then you've got to keep things in context. And so, if you keep reading through 1 Corinthians 15, and I don't have time to take you those two places, but if you keep reading through 1 Corinthians 15, you find out that the whole thing is about the resurrection of Christ. And he says in there, if Christ be not risen, your faith is vain, you're yet in your sins. So he says, unless you have believed in vain, is a reference to whether or not you believe Christ rose from the dead. Again, as we give the gospel and we look at it here, the gospel is not just Christ died. We need to say it right. The gospel is not just that Christ died. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins. Why did he die? For our sins. Christ died for our sins. Well, that's one part. And he was buried. That's another part. And what else happened? He rose from the grave. That's the three parts of the gospel. And they all play a role in providing the salvation for those who will do what? Believe. Believe. Everybody there? Maybe I need to do a message or a series on those three parts in real detail. <coughs> it says, unless you believed in vain. So the idea there with that phrase is, if Christ didn't raise from the grave, your faith is vain. If Jesus wasn't resurrected, that means that the Father wasn't satisfied with the sacrifice and didn't bring him out of the grave. But because the Father was satisfied with the sacrifice of his Son, <laughs> he brought him out of there. We like to say he died with our sins, went to the grave, and left our sins, and came out of there without our sins. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so he goes on now and gives the gospel. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So Paul's telling these Corinthians, Y'all remember what I preached to you. And he says, so here's what I delivered to you. Here's what I brought. You know, delivering the mail. Here's what I brought to you. Here's what I delivered to you. He says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So what was the gospel that Paul was trusting for his salvation? The gospel of Christ. And now he tells us what that is. He goes on then and says, uh, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Somebody says, show me the gospel. Where are you going to take them? First Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. You know, one through four, but specifically three and four. What's the gospel of our salvation? First Corinthians 15, three and four. There's nowhere else in Scripture that so clearly tells you plainly this is the gospel. The gospel of our salvation. And so he was buried. He rose again the third day. He died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. And all those things are important. And it's the how that he did that. He took our sins upon himself. And yet, we'll build on this more as we go. Back to Romans chapter 1. So when Paul says, verse 17 there, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, then we kind of have some understanding. Well, what is this righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith? The righteousness of God that's revealed as we share the gospel with others from faith to faith, as we do that, the righteousness of God is that is revealed is, 
as we keep studying, we'll see it. This righteousness of God is that is revealed is that in that gospel, a holy, righteous God provided a means for by which anybody could be saved. And as we throw in there, thinking about the Greeks and the barbarians, uh, when Paul says, well, well, listen, wouldn't that be the religious and the non-religious? The Greeks and the barbarians? The wise and the other wise? The porch dogs and the wild dogs? Mm -hmm. Y'all put that together? So here's a gospel that reveals the righteousness of God. Well, how can God, a holy, righteous God, accept a dirty, rotten, wild dog? His son took all that wild dog sin on himself, bore it in his body, carried it to the depths of hell and left it there, and came out victorious. That's how it's revealed. God is righteous in providing salvation to all that believe, not because of who we are, but because of everything his son is. Isn't that good news? That's just point one. <laughs> Number two, Romans chapter three. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, but the righteousness of God is by faith of Jesus Christ. And that's a big deal too. And some of these things, you know, we hit on these things as we preach and teach messages and and so we just kind of bring them together in a different way and a different message like we're doing here. But uh, we, we've seen Romans 1.16 before. And we've seen Romans 3 before. But we're putting it together in this way so we can focus on this idea of the righteousness of God. <coughs> righteousness. And so in Romans chapter 3, we begin at verse 19. You know, you just got to pick a place to start, you know. He says, verse 19, now we know. You think it might be important sometimes just to stop and pause and absorb what you just read? We started out over in Romans 1. Paul said, I wouldn't have you be ignorant, brethren. We stopped and paused. Let's talk about that. Right? Paul doesn't want us to be ignorant. The Lord Jesus Christ, the ascended Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, as he revealed this information to Paul, and Paul begins to write these things down for us today in the church, the body of Christ. Paul writes, God doesn't want us to, he, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren. Well, it's kind of important to stop and not just brush over that. So we do the same thing here, verse 9, verse 19. Now we know. Do you think there might be times in conversation that, uh, and I'll, 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 I'll put myself in here, you might put yourself in there, <clears throat> but do you think there might be times in conversation that I might offend people because I come on so strong and so emphatic and so absolute in what I might present? You think that might be a possibility? Yeah. <laughs> I know, you know, somebody will say something on Facebook and I'll have a response or I'll post something on Facebook. And it's come back to me sometimes by private message, but even public, you know, somebody make a comment. And, and I can remember one guy, uh, he, he doesn't live here, but he's got property here and he goes back and forth. And, and, uh, and, uh, you know, I was pretty dogmatic and emphatic about a certain issue uh, a year or two ago. And, uh, I mean, it's not like this is the only time it's happened. It's just the, <laughs> the moment I'm thinking about that's come to my mind. And so this guy, he, he, he sends me a note and uh, well, he made a comment on my post. And, and uh, you, just, you just seem to be so absolute and just think you're right. It ain't about me being right. It's about the scripture being right. I believe the scriptures. Here's what the scriptures say. 
Now, if you can take the scriptures and show me something different that's too forward about us, then you and I can have this conversation. But if you're just going to say you don't like it because I'm absolute and I have convictions and I believe things to be true in the Word of God and that upsets you because it's contrary to what you think, I've been seeing this meme go around on Facebook a whole lot lately. There's, do, you, do you know what's missing in the Word of God? Your opinion. <laughs> That's missing in the Word of God. My opinion, your opinion. So what we think, what we've always been taught, what we've always heard, it really doesn't matter. What matters is what saith the Scripture. Amen? And so, when Paul says, verse 19... Now we know. That's an absolute. Isn't it? Here's something we know. So as I read something there, and, I, and, and, and again, I, I like to emphasize, God, through Jesus Christ, from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, revealed to Apostle Paul to write down some things and so as we read this, we're not just talking about the words of Paul, our apostle, which that's important, but it's to understand the words of Paul, our apostle, he got from the heavenly Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And so when Paul writes down in Romans chapter 3, verse 19, now we know. Well, I don't like Paul. I think Paul was just kind of an egotist. I, I'm going to just, you know, Paul says he knows, but how do we know that that's so? This is the scriptures, folks. This is the word of God. And so Paul says, now we know. So if I come across strong sometimes with the things that I'm teaching or in a conversation and I present something to you, well, we'll understand that confidence doesn't come from within myself. It's not an arrogant thing. It's I know what the scriptures say. Amen. My confidence is not in me or my authority. My confidence is in the scripture. And so when Dr. Bible Stopper, who has a big radio program or a big television program or writes books and makes thousands and millions of dollars off his books, has a great big congregation, the TV program, all that stuff, when he says one thing and I come around and I say to you, that guy's wrong. <clears throat> well, sometimes the people think, well, who are you? How many doctors do you have behind your name? How big a congregation are you preaching to? How many books have you written? How big is your radio ministry? How far widespread is your television broadcast? How many countries have you gone to and preached and filled auditoriums and stadiums and all that? Well, no. Well, what gives you the authority? This book. Yeah. Folks, the book's the authority. Right? Mm -hmm. The book is the authority. I'm spending a lot of time on that. I know. We're not going to get very far. <laughs> That's all right. I, 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 I said I wasn't going to rush through this. I'm going to take my time. So, so part one may be two or three sentences. <laughs> so he says, now we know. That's good. You can have confidence in the Word of God. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Of course, he's talking about the law of Moses. It says that every mountain may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 21. Here's two more words we need to pay attention to. But now, you read your Bible, it says one thing, and then you come across these two words. But now, does that signify a change? Mm -hmm. It was like this, but now, 
It's like this. He said back there that, you know, Israel was under the law. Israel was the one who received the law. God gave to Moses the law. He wrote it down. And folks understand, that's just not the Ten Commandments. There were 613 laws that we get in those books of Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The law of Moses, Genesis 3, Deuteronomy. 613 laws. It wasn't just 10. 10 was put on the tablets. Moses wrote a whole bunch more. And they all came from God. Somebody says, I keep the law. No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I try real hard to. Well, guess what? Everybody who refers to the law says, if you break one point, you're guilty of every bit of it. So how are we doing? <laughs> we ain't doing real great, are we? But he makes that reference there in verse 20. By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. And so what had happened by the time, you know, Paul, by the time Jesus shows up on the scene, certainly by the time Paul shows up on the scene, the Jews were practicing a faithless religion. They were going about the deeds of the law without faith. Yo. Mm -hmm. Okay. They were, they were doing what they were supposed to do, quote unquote, not doing what they weren't supposed to do. And they had a righteousness of the law, but they didn't have any righteousness, they didn't have any justification because they were doing it by the motions of the flesh without any faith. So that's what he's talking about in verse 20. By the deeds of the law, just by doing the law, it doesn't help anybody, it didn't help them, and it won't help anybody. Okay. So that's why he comes along verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God without the law. Now again, she won't make just a minute. The righteousness of God without doing the do's and not doing the don'ts. Right? The righteousness of God without the law is manifested. It was brought forth so we can see it. Halloween's come. I don't do Halloween, never have done Halloween. You do Halloween, that's fine. Never have done. But I can use that to kind of bring, you know, Halloween comes and you have these manifestations. The ghosts and the goblins. The witches and the walls. The, these manifestations. Some of them are going to come knock at your door and look for Nancy. you are already seen it on TV. All the scary movies are coming out. It's manifestations. You see, you know, bring it out where you can see it. Have an idea of what the word means. So if now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, made where you can see it, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, well, the thing that was witnessed by the law and the prophets is, is the coming of Christ. Turn back there to Romans chapter 1 and verse 2. 1 and 2. Paul, Romans 1, 1 and 2, 3. <laughs> Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, verse 2 in parentheses there, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made in the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. So when he talks about verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets foretold of the coming of Christ and what he would go through. Okay? So we're talking about the righteousness of God. Now the righteousness of God is made manifest, and it's witnessed. It's brought forth so we can see it, and it's witnessed by the law and the prophets. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God. Well, now we got it twice. We got it in verse 21. Now we got it in verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is how? By faith, By faith of Jesus. Jesus Christ unto all. 
and upon all them that believe. Now let me hit this nail again in just a minute. I said a while ago, if you don't have a King James Bible, your Bible says in Romans 1 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It leaves out of Christ. Mm -hmm. Gospel of Christ. That's, again, it's important. Which gospel? Gospel of Christ. Paul's gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, other places. And so when you are in verse 22 there, if you don't have a King James Bible, it says something along the line of the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ. You tell me, is there a difference between faith of Christ and faith in Christ? A little bit word. Of or in. Do two letter words make a difference in the meaning? Yeah. yeah. So the faith of Christ has to do with his faith. Faith in Christ has to do with my faith. Now again, as we continue our study next week, we'll talk about our faith in Christ. But right here, we're talking about the faith of Christ. That's a different thing. It's important to have the right Bible or you don't get that doctrine. And so he says, verse 22 there, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them believe for there is no difference. Well again, what is this faith of Christ? This faith of Christ was that in the in the in the before the foundation of the world, before time ever was, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in their foreknowledge of what would take place, there was a determined counsel that the Son would come to this earth take upon himself the form of a man, live a sinless life, fulfill the righteousness of the law, and as the sinless Son of God, go to that cross, the most vile, uh, horrible means of death that were available at the time, only for the most wicked, vile criminals, the cross, right? That he would go to that cross, and on that cross... He would bear the sin of the world. And then he would die and go to hell. And then be raised from the dead. So when Jesus left heaven's glory and took upon himself the form of a man and became obedient to his Father, and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus, Jesus said over and over again, He said, I know nothing of myself but what the Father gives me. So Jesus lives, he knows what the Father tells him, and he goes to that cross. Remember in the garden when he prayed, Lord, if there's any way, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He's in the garden. He knows he's fixing to be betrayed. He knows he's fixing to go to the cross. He's been telling the apostles that's what's going to happen. They didn't believe it. But he knows that's what's going to happen. And so he's on his knees, he's in the garden, and he's praying. You know the story about, he's praying as if it were great drops of blood. You know, I mean, agonizing in prayer before the Father. He knows what's coming. And it's not just the torment, the torture of the physical part of the cross, but it's that taking the sin of the world. That bitter cup. He says, Father, it didn't be possible. Let this cup pass for me. Father, if there's a plan B, four and a half big time. <laughs> Father, if it be possible, while well, in his heart and mind he knew it wasn't. But if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. And then the words he said, nevertheless, pay attention. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now you tell me Jesus Christ, the Son of God, didn't have faith and didn't have trust in the Father when he had heaven's glory, set aside that part of his majesty and his glory, and became a diaper-pooping baby, 
in a manger? Think about that. Lived his life in subjection to earthly parents, you know, stepdad and mom. Went through all the stuff he went through and then bore our sins. You think that took some faith? The faith of Christ. So when you read there now, verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all is the righteousness of God, which comes by faith of Jesus Christ, is it unto all. Is that righteousness available for everybody? Is that righteousness available for the Greeks and the barbarians? For the wise and the unwise? For the religious and the down and out heathen? Mm -hmm. Is it available for everybody? Mm -hmm. Is it provision for everybody? Yeah, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, is unto all. But this is an important doctrinal point for us to get a hold of as I try to bring this thing to the end of the day. It's unto all. That's why we say it's revealed from faith to faith. I can go to the most religious person I know and seek to tell them the gospel with hope and prayer that they'll hear it, receive it, and trust Christ in spite of their religion. And I can go to the most down and out, dirty, filthy, God forsaken in our minds, perverted sinner who thinks that maybe they've sinned beyond the grace of God. Because some preacher told them that. Who thinks they've sinned beyond the grace of God because some preacher told them that. You're too far gone. You've sinned away your dead grace. God forbid somebody preach some damnable heresy like that. Go to that person. And you can share with them. Because the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, is unto all. It's only good. But it's only upon all. Righteousness is only upon all them that do what? Believe. They believe. Believe what? Jesus, the Son of the God, went to Calvary's cross and died and shed his blood for my sin, paid my sin debt, was buried, took those sins to the depths of hell, left them there, and came forth out of that grave victorious. Mm -hmm. I'm trusting what he did. And so when you believe that, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, is now on you. Whose righteousness? Yours. The righteousness of God. How does it come? Because Jesus had faith and was obedient to the Father and did everything that was asked of him. Right? Mm -hmm. And because of that, when we believe that, his righteousness, the righteousness of God is given to us. Boy, it just doesn't get much better. It says it's unto all and upon them that believe, for there is no difference. There's no difference between the wise and the unwise, the Greek and the barbaric, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody said the foot of the cross is, the, the, the ground at the foot of the cross is left for death. <clears throat> Let me finish reading here and we'll be done for the day. Verse 23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified. Praise there's another word I love. Freely. Freely. You can't earn this. Being justified freely by us, I'm just going to read it and I'll come back and preach it next week, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith, made right with God by faith, without the deeds of the law. 
Or again, I need to go back and preach through some of that, but I'm way past time. And uh, I appreciate your attention. The righteousness of God. Well, if we didn't preach anything more about it, we got a good love of it today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The righteousness of God. But you know what, folks? We're just barely scratching the surface. There's a lot of stuff we get covered. I had five points this morning, and I almost covered two of them. <laughs> almost. Almost. Yeah. Uh, any questions or comments? <clears throat> Let's have another prayer. Sing our song. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity to come together and study your word. We thank you for the grace. We thank you for our salvation. Yes, All these many things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You've never had that moment in time where you trusted in Christ alone and what he did for your salvation. We don't need to sing ten stanzas of just as I am. We don't need to say walk the aisle and come talk to one of us. Right where you are, wherever you are, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. Jesus did everything that needed to be done, and I'm trusting him. You can do that right now. Like the preacher said recently, if somebody, if you do that at some point, come tell somebody. And the reason you come tell somebody is so if you were to die. And a preacher's going to preach your funeral. Somebody could say, hey, look, I know he trusted Christ. He told me he trusted Christ. Or she told me she trusted Christ. <laughs> Otherwise, the preacher doesn't know how to, what, what to preach and how to say. Right? <laughs> so if you trust in Christ, tell somebody. So the preacher knows what to say at your funeral. <laughs> Amen. All right. Let's sing the song. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Trails to you. Keep smiling until then. Who cares about the clouds when we're together? Just sing a song and bring the sunny weather. Happy trails to you. Till we meet again. Appreciate your kitchen. We'll be back here next Sunday. Same time, same station. All right. <laughs>